Welcome back to another episode of This Week in Creationism. This is episode number 11, recorded on November 1st, 2021. My name is Joel Duff, and I take a look at the headlines in creationism from the past week. Today we have snails, slugs, and semi-slugs, uh, forests, and the ice ages. And take a look at a couple Ken Ham tweets, among a few other items. So turning right to snails and slugs. This article published on Answers in Genesis website this week. Snails and slugs, a perfect evolutionary transition? Question mark. Here's the title of the article. Snails, slugs, and semi-slugs. That's actually the, the, the more complete title now. A perfect evolutionary transition. And the first thing you may wonder is, what, uh, you know, you know, it's like, I know what a slug is, and I know what a snail is, but what in the world is a semi-slug? Well, <laughs> I mean, a semi-slug is exactly what it sounds like. It's not exactly a slug, um, but it's not really a snail either. It's something that feels like something in between because it has a, it does have a conical shell usually, but it's not large enough to contain the whole organism, and so it can't hide completely within it. So it's kind of like um, it's kind of like a reduced snail home, um, or you can think of it as a slug carrying around a little bit of a snail home. Um, and so, it, you know, it, if you look at it, you go like, you know, that you could imagine that's a transitionary stage between a snail and a slug. Um, historically, there, there are a lot more snails than there are slugs. And there are, as we're going to see, hundreds of families of snails. Um, and there aren't nearly as many different kinds of slugs. Uh, and there's actually a lot of different semi-slugs. So semi-slugs have been proposed as an evolutionary transition uh, sort of a waypoint between uh, on the process of losing the snail shell and becoming more uh, independent of that shell uh, as a slug. Although it turns out a lot of slugs have kind of this internal um, shell basically inside. All right, and that's exactly what this article is about. It, you know, um, this particular author found a, a popular article talking about this process of of how semi slugs are a transition stage and how at least a dozen times in evolutionary history it's proposed that um, snails have lost their shells and, to become various lineages of slugs. Yeah, first of all, I want to say something about uh, Harry F. Sanders III, the author of this article. I've mentioned him before, a previous YouTube video. Uh, I talked about, I, I, I had this YouTube called, Who Wrote This? And I, I looked at the common practice of publishing articles under pseudonyms uh, in creationist literature. Uh, and Harry F. Sanders is probably one of the most prolific, uh, along with John Woodmerap, as a pseudonym. Um, and um, it, this is at least maybe the 40th article that uh, Harry F. Sanders has published uh, on the Answers in Genesis website. He, or I, I guess it could be a she, um, has uh, written on a number of different topics. And here we go with uh, slugs and semi-slugs. Ultimately, Harry Sanders' conclusion is, is that snails and slugs are different things, and semi-slugs themselves are also different things. In other words, they're different created kinds. Uh, he argues that the complexity of a snail uh, versus the very the different complexity of a of a of a slug doesn't allow the two to transition from one to another. Effectively, saying that they are um, significantly different, and therefore. Uh, they can't, one can't become the other, so therefore they're different kinds of organisms, and therefore God created those kinds separately. Uh, and then possibly semi-slugs are their individual own kind of thing. And if that's the case, then semi-slugs are not a transitional form from snails uh, into slugs. Um, you know, and, and this goes all, all the way back to the discussion that creationists have about what constitutes a kind uh, what can what how much how much diversity or how much change can occur within a kind and he's taken a position here that um, this change from having a shell to losing a shell would be uh, too much change um, even considering uh, the whole idea of genetic entropy and and the loss of things is uh, fairly common in organisms uh, so I all, the only point I want to make out, out of this particular article because I he, he presents a fairly simple story, and then he simply throws out a whole bunch of different things about complexity that, in his mind, means that uh, these transitions are impossible. 
uh, even though I would certainly suggest that uh, there are other families or other groups of organisms that creationists believe are all one kind and that very large transitions within those families have occurred uh, in the past, uh, probably requiring as much change as he's, as he's proposing can't happen in, in this particular case. But I also think he undersells the amount of <laughs> genetic variation and divergence uh, in this family. And it might be worth thinking about this just for a second here. Uh, snails and slugs are called gastropods or grouped in a larger group of gastropods. You can kind of think of that as uh, snails and slugs maybe doing, doing gr different groups of mammals. And so they're a type of mammal. So here you have like a type of gastropod. But look at this. There's 721 living and extinct families of snails and slugs that have been identified um, by, by scientists. So if, remember, a family is, is a grouping of species and genera or groups of species um, that are similar to one another, have enough similar features that they're put in the same family. So kind of like canines and felines and the bear family and so forth and mammals. Um, 721. Uh, you know, there's only... Uh, 200, I can't remember if it's 125 or 225 families of mammals. Um, so that's a lot of different kinds of snails, right? Now you just use the word kinds, kinds of snails. And, and that's what I think creationists actually have to think of these as is 721 different kinds of snails and slugs, uh, representing 85 to 120,000 named species, depending on how you break, how you define a species. But there's likely a lot more that haven't been named. So, you know, think of at least 200,000 different species uh, have been named. We don't even know how many uh, are extinct things uh, that we don't identify from the fossil record because there's not the greatest fossil record, obviously, of slugs. Um, but also think about this. There are marine snails and there are terrestrial snails. There are um, snails that live in a, in freshwater aquatic places, often they're in the same family, and then there's marine water uh, snails. There are marine slugs, and there are freshwater slugs, and there are terrestrial slugs. Um, there are some families of slugs and snails that include members that live in two of these different locations, and so represent quite a bit of variation in terms of their habitat um, which obviously must represent a lot of genetic variation, and yet they can live in those two different environments. But they're still so distinct from other groups of snails and slugs, they're put into separate families. There are a couple families that include snails and slugs in them, which is highly suggestive of the idea that the two are related to each other. Now, if this author is right, and that snails and slugs can't possibly have share a common ancestor, then those families, and there aren't many of them, but those families that have semi-slugs in them and slugs or semi-slugs and snails, um, he would have to, or he or she would have to argue that those are not in the same family, but they must be separate families uh, and divide them even further than the 721 and say that God created 721 plus a bunch more separate groups of things that we collectively call snails and slugs, um, but are each as different from each other as as any other, like a, a cat and a dog are, right? So thousands of semi-slugs species, and many of them are in other families of snails. So if semi-slugs are not separately created or are separately created, then again, all those would have to be separated out of those families and said to be different. Uh, I took a look at a couple of phylogenetic trees to look at like genetic relatedness, and there are some semi-slugs that are fairly similar to other snails. Um, and so it seems very reasonable to say that snails can partially lose their ability to completely contain themselves inside of a shell uh, and become what are called semi-slugs, although maybe you call them semi-snails at that point, right? Okay, anyway, that's snails and slugs. I think that is going to be a fairly complicated story with respect to uh, biblical kinds and like how they're preserved and so forth. Okay, now let's go to Institute for Creation Research, see what they're up to. Um, yeah, a couple articles here. Did the earth tilt during the flood? There was a, there was a recent publication that suggested that um, long ago, um, very long ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, 
that it was possible that the the earth had was actually tipped on its axis um, and uh, the the evidence for that is rather mm, I'll say it's a little bit flimsy, and I agree with this particular article where they say it's pretty flimsy. Although in the end they say if it happened, that's not a problem because maybe something happened during the flood, right? Um, so I, this article wasn't a huge deal. This other thing here: does the universe look old? All right, this is a common. I think they write something with that title, and probably every creationist organization does. Pretty much writes an article of a very similar ilk uh, every six months or so. Um, does the universe look old? You know, they go through some of the standard arguments about how, well, look at the Pluto surface. That doesn't look like it's billions of years old. It's been reshaped within the past, you know, 100,000 years or a million years. Or look at the rings of Saturn. And, um, you know, even scientists say that they're not as old as the solar system and that they're much younger. And so does the universe look old? Well, no, there are parts of it that look quite young. Of course, quite young sometimes is still 100,000, 100 million years, maybe half a billion years. Um, what, what none of these little things look like, though, is none of them look like they're 6,000 years old. Um, but it's just a, a way of saying, oh, well, look, you know, yeah, everything isn't 6 billion years old. And if something's younger looking, then, um, you know, maybe, 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 maybe scientists are wrong about the age of the universe. And so um, maybe it's only 6,000 years old. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, that's going pretty far you know, in the other direction. Um, but it's just casting doubt uh, on, on what scientists have said. And, you know, yeah, sure. Scientists looked at Saturn originally and, and thought that everything about that planet was very old. But now we know that the, you know, it's very likely the rings are, are much, much younger than the planet itself. But that doesn't mean that the solar system can't be old just because parts of it are young, right? Okay. There are new things in the solar system. There are changes that occur. Um, change and uh, you know dramatic changes that occur, uh, they're allowed. That is allowed to happen. <laughs> okay, what I, want, I wanted to get to was this one here. African forest evidence fits fossil, uh, fits flood ice age model. And if we read the text here, we see that scientists have found genetic evidence suggesting that legume trees emerged from separate African tree populations during the Ice Age. During the Ice Age, these tree populations emerged very, very quickly. And, and the thing they're going to emphasize is that there's, a, there's several different species of legumes. And then the, even within those species, there's genetic diversity that is... Uh, um, distributed in um, uh, not random ways, all right, so that there are subgroups of species in different parts of Africa. Uh, and to them, they're saying, like, look at all this genetic diversity, these different species and these subpopulations that have all developed uh, because of the Ice Age, right? And the Ice Age wasn't that long ago, so da da, organisms can change quickly. And guess what? We believe that there was an ice age after the flood. Uh, and so that fits just nicely with what scientists are saying. They're saying that the ice age has sculpted different plants and organisms and created the kind of genetic variations we see. And that's what our ice age explains. Uh, so that's awesome. Well, <laughs> let's, where, they, where, they, where they look to to find the information for their particular article of what they're summarizing is actually a popular um, rep a, a popular summary of the original research article uh, in Sci.org. Uh, this one, DNA reveals how ice ages affected African forests. Now, first thing I'm going to point out here is ages, whereas over here, during the ice age, very clearly indicating singular. But in fact, these scientists are suggesting how ice ages, in other words, multiple ice ages, have affected African rainforest. Um, let's see this a little bit further. So here's, here's the article by Jake Hebert. Um, Hebert, Hebert? Maybe it's Hebert. Actually, I've never heard um, how someone pronounces that. I have, to, I have to look that up. I have to find out. They do include a quote from the paper, from, well, actually not from the paper. They're including a, a quote from the summary of the paper. 
Uh, we examined DNA of five legume trees, found that wi found widely in African rainforest. We identified significant genetic traces of fragmentation, physical splits between populations, at dates that suggest the forest retreated during cool, arid pe periods caused by ice ages. Now here they have to use the word ages because it's 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 in the quote. And what this paper is suggesting is that when there's a, a forest right if if you have a continuous forest what you have is you have continuous uh, mix genetic mixing and so uh, a species of trees that's in a forest isn't going to end up with a fragmented pattern of of different um different genetic variations and they're not going to become different species if they're all together because they're constantly mixing their gene pool uh, and so the suggestion is though that you had a forest in an area like a savanna african savanna um uh, I'm sorry, African rainforest. And then during an ice age, that forest got broken up, right? With less water, it's cooler, more arid. And so the, 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 the forest became separated into separate groups, right? Isolated populations. Maybe they're on mountaintops or something like that, right? Separated by some desert. And because of that separation, they then develop differences between them, right? Because they have different mutations, different selectional pressure, um, and genetic drift, and all the different forces uh, that ev evolutionary mechanisms that change organisms occur, uh, and new mutations that are occurring. And then when those plant, when the ice age ends, and the plants are able to to come back together because now there's a more uniform climate in that area. And the plants meet each other again. Well, they're different from each other now, and so maybe they're different species. So now they maybe they coexist as different species, um, or at the very least, they have they're still in sort of groupings based on their past history because of this genetic isolation. Um, that's the suggestion in the paper that they think they found, they can see this history of ice ages fragmenting and then bringing back the species and then fragmenting them again and bringing them back. And what the paper is suggesting is this happened over and over and over and over again over a period of 10 million years because there's been multiple different ice ages, you know, creating multiple different iterations of, of forest moving back and forth and, and isolation events. Answers, uh, ICR and, uh, and this because they only have the one ice age and the ice age occurred right after the flood. So they have to suggest that plants just happened to, you know, seeds of legumes survive the flood and they're just lying around. They begin to, uh, they begin to grow. And so there's going to be different kinds of legumes growing in maybe different places, but it's going to be kind of random, right? Because the flood kind of scrambled everything up. Uh, and then you have this ice age uh, and then maybe some of those trees got isolated uh, and then they come back. So they're trying to say that the single ice age is what, cause this uh, fragmentation pattern. Um, and I don't know if they're really going to say there's different species because they're going to say different species survive the flood in different seeds. So it's kind of a stretch to say that, hey, look at this. Um, you know, this paper, these scientists are finding this pattern and we can show how this pattern exists with this single ice age, except they're not really showing that. They're just implying that this single ice age could somehow do the same thing. And I, I can tell you, Looking at the original paper, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Um, actually, I'm going to skip down to the bottom here it, because here's their summary. Once again, we see that biblical creation, with its short time scale and global flood, rather than being an embarrassment or problem for which Christians need to sheepishly, sheepishly apologize, it's the key to making sense of Earth history. Well, there's, there's, really, there's not much in here that suggests that they're able to explain this data any better. Um, in fact, the original paper, here's the original paper. Um, the original paper talks about all these dispersal events and the time you know, you're gonna need in between all these different ice ages. Uh, and it shows the amount of genetic divergence that has occurred, which is gonna include needing a lot of mutations and a lot of natural selection happening on. Uh, you know, all that data, I look at that and I say, that that does not fit a single Ice Age recent event at all. Um, if anything, this particular data should be a, a severe challenge um, to the creationist model. And yet somehow they just kind of conclude that 
you know, our model actually, rather than being an embarrassment, which I think actually is a problem, you know, um, it's the key to making sense of Earth history. There's nothing uh, that's providing any kind of solution here, really. Uh, so I don't know how you can say it's the key. It's just kind of like this line you add at the end of almost every article saying, oh, if we said all this stuff and then look at that. Um, our model is better, is what that pretty much amounts to. Okay, Ken Ham tweets. Uh, Ken Ham tweets a lot. Uh, and the thing I'll say about Ken Ham's tweets is, is that if I, and I periodically I've done this, I've gone through and I've, I've just added up like all of his tweets. I look at it like the past 100 tweets and I'll just mark down, you know, is this tweet have anything to do with science or creation science or even uh, anything having to do with the flood or biblical models of creation? And then what is other stuff? Usually some kind of a commentary on social issues. And it's pretty much it, it, at one time about, I'll say, seven or eight years ago, um, you know, it was it was a, almost an even split. Um, but now it's more like nine to one, uh, nine social issues and one, and sometimes much less than that, uh, depending on which survey, which random sampling of 100 I do at which time, it's less than one of science stories. So here are some, here's some typical stuff. And I just, you know, grabbed a couple things. Um, you know, so here he's, he's, he's pointing out, now this actually does involve science, but it's not really, a, you know, it's not actually a science story. So I wouldn't count this as science, right? He's, he's, he's linking to a science story. Scientists discover prehistoric girl in Indonesia. Uh, and so uh, and, and this actually was a very interesting story about some genetics uh, they did in this particular case. But he doesn't mention any of that. Uh, he just mentions, he just notes that the title says prehistoric. Well, how do they know this was female? Maybe she identified as a male. And you see the, the implication here. So it's, it's all about gender identity saying, well, well, if an anthropologist can identify male and female, then why is it that we can't, you know, be clear about what male and female is today? And I, that for Ken Ham, that's something that's on his mind constantly. And he's constantly trying to I'll say create sort of the, the culture war um, uh, mentality and attitude uh, in his followers. How about over here? This is uh, another really common uh, one. And uh, this, this is kind of a repeated uh, theme over and over again. What do all these compromise positions? So again, uh, it calls, likes to call anything that's not his view, a compromise view on Genesis have in common. Answer, trying to fit in supposed million years into the Bible. Millions of years belief is part of the religion of evolution. Again, as evolution is a religion, attempted to justify rejecting God, right? It's actually saying that anybody holding in these positions is, is ultimately trying to reject God. Do not add to his words. Um, now, he is adding to his words through, you know, like articles on the Ice Age and uh, fitting all this stuff in, which is not explicitly in the Bible or barely even inferred in the Bible. Well, we can't ultimately save the earth as God's wills God as God will judge it by fire one day in the future. And then quote Second Peter three ten. Well, now Second Peter three ten is highly contentious, uh, uh, you know, highly debated uh, verse in the Bible in terms of what it exactly means to be. Uh, judged by fire. Uh, man was given dominion over the earth to use it for man's good and God's glory. But if people reject the flood of Noah's day and the ice age it generated, oh, here we go. And the ice age it generated, right? As if this is like, you know, he's teaching what the Bible is saying. Like this, is, or I, I call that adding to the Bible right there, that he's adding on this, like you have to believe in the flood but you also better believe in this ice age that the flood generated. Well, even if there was an ice age mentioned in the Bible after the flood, how would you know that the flood actually generated it? Right. That's that's a that's something that uh, he has inferred uh, that, that is not explicitly commanded or directed or to uh, talked about in the Bible. They will not understand the significant climate change that has gone on for 4,300 years. Now, see, if the ice age could happen so quickly, 
uh, just 4,300 years ago. Um, that shows that the world really can change very, very rapidly. But obviously, that that ice age wasn't caused by man, right? Right by anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide, right? That was caused by the flood. Um, although, <laughs> technically, I guess, right, the flood was caused by man. <laughs> but uh, but he's saying like physically, the flood caused that ice age. Uh, not man's, uh, you know, pollution of the earth. And he goes on to say, yes, now the whole creation groans because of the effects of sin and the flood and the ice age, right? Again, adding on this ice age, all right, the, 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 flex of, the effects of the flood and the ice age, we're still feeling the effects of that. Um, but... Noah promised while the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Now, what he's implying here is that, and he, he's tweeted many other people about this, that, oh, see, the, the global warming and climate change people say that the climate is warming and that is, it's going to you know, wipe out lots of different organisms and, and uh, change, you know, completely change the surface of the world. And he's kind of implying here that, you know, well, if you look at Romans 8.22, um, it says that, you know, God promised Noah that there would be seed time and harvest, that, you know, as long as the earth remains, right, cold and heat, right? It's not all just going to be hot. There's actually going to be cold and heat. Uh, I'm sorry, but... Um, does that really mean that uh, the world is going to become all hot and there won't be any seed time or harvest uh, and there's there's not going to be any summer or winter and the day and night is, is going to cease? No. No. I mean, there's going to be heat and cold. There's going to be seed time and harvest and there's going to be summer and the winter in the future. The, 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 the concern about climate change is that it changes where those things occur in, in the sense of, uh, you know, harvest right right now you have harvest in the midwest but if the climate were to change enough maybe you wouldn't have the same type of harvest you would have there but somebody else is going to be harvesting something somewhere else um, the harvest might not be as good overall as it was in the past right there could be a lot of damage to the harvest but there still would be harvest uh, think about the earth today and think about the earth even just a couple thousand years ago when he made the promise to noah um, there's the Sahara Desert, right? There's not much harvesting going on there, right? And it's pretty warm all the time there, right? Does, does that mean that God's promise wasn't kept, right? Did, did, did you know, as, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest, but there are places on earth where there is no seed time and there is no harvest. And there's Antarctica where it's cold all the time and there really isn't any heat. And there are places where there really isn't any summer, all right, already. Um, so, but I, you know, I don't think any of us would interpret this verse to say that God's promise hasn't been kept uh, since the time of Noah. There is seed time and harvest. There is cold and heat. There is summer and winter. There obviously is day and night. All right. None of those things are ceasing. And even climate change is not going to cause those to cease any more than, well, maybe it's going to change the climate faster, but it's not going to change it in the sense of like things that haven't already happened right after uh, Noah's flood or the ice age. Didn't the ice age dramatically change the earth? Okay, last up. Just saw this hmm, 15 minutes ago. Oh, more than 15 minutes ago, because I've already been talking for more than 15 minutes just before I started this video. Uh, I had to take a screenshot. This is from a uh, YouTube channel, Standing for Truth. Uh, they made a short clip called uh, Creation Basics created heterozygosity uh, and it's an ex explanation about how all the biological diversity on earth can be explained by created heterozygosity um, and created heterozygosity is the idea that the original created kinds original kinds of organisms that that god made had all the variation needed in them that could then express itself as many 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 different species and diversification over time and adaptability to new changes in the environment over time. Um, yes, yeah, so climate change, right, is already accounted for uh, in God's original creation because he already created the variation for them to adapt to those things. Um, 
Okay, but what got me was this particular image that scrolled across the screen. I was I was flummoxed by it, and I still don't know how to explain it. Um, I've I've talked to you in other videos about the fact that Answers in Genesis considers gorillas, uh, orangutans, and chimpanzees to all be one kind. All right, they're all related to one another by one common ancestor. And this is what this represents. We're saying like, here's all this genetic diversity originally found in the nucleus of the original kind. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but this is a mitochondrion. And they're saying like the mitochondrion is the power plant. So through the use of energy, through God made mitochondria, which is the, the power center of, of a cell, um, that, that genetic diversity could be um, divided, all right? through use of natural selection and other other techniques like that into separate pools of variation that we would call orangutan species and ape, the ape species and the chimpanzee species. And then I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, what in the world is this, right? This looks like a, a human being, um, although it's kind of like crouched down, but it has clothes on. Is this supposed to represent I don't know, Homo erectus, or, or, um, or something even older. Uh, uh, one of the fossils, like Homo um, uh, floresiens, or something like that. I, I, I just like I'm just like flabbergasted at this particular image because it's suggesting that all of these things are related to a common ancestor, right? It's saying all of these are one kind, and in the kind they have this human-looking thing, this hominin. Um, which I assume they're trying to say is not really a human because I'm sure they have another human being somewhere as being separately created by God. But I didn't think that creationists accepted that there were hominins that were so similar to humans that they were able to make their own clothes, right? That they had that much cultural awareness. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe this is a Neanderthal. Maybe they don't even think that Neanderthals are human. Um, they're, I, I know they're not followers of Hugh Ross, but um, they, they, they seem to be going in that direction. Anyway, uh, I'll have to explore this video a little bit further. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it because created heterozygosity is um, the catch-all, uh, end-all, easy answer that uh, at the end of the day doesn't actually mean anything uh, when you explore it a little bit further. And if you know any genetics, uh, watching this kind of video will just literally make your head explode with the, you'll just be astounded that somebody could suggest that <laughs> there could be enough heterozygosity in a single created kind to uh, create all this uh, genetic diversity that we have today. Uh, that's it for this week in creationism. It's kind of a wild and wacky week. I, I'll try to, I know I, I'm, I've got my eye on a couple other um, lesser known creationist websites. Uh, and so I'm pulling up a few things from those. So maybe I'll share those next. Um, so I'll you know, continue to hit up what Answers in Genesis and ICR is doing, but, um, you know, trying to throw in a little diversity, all right, a little, little spice into uh, the mix here and uh, see what some of the more fringe uh, young earth creationists are are doing and hanging out and saying these days. All right, that's it for me. Again, my name's Joel Duff, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll be back in a week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.